Proton spectroscopy is used for a number of organic molecules. In this video, I'm going to focus just on NMR of alcohols. And something that is kind of a telltale sign of an alcohol is that you'll find single protons by themselves. I'm going to give a brief run through of how we look at NMR, um, but you should refer to some of my other videos covering NMR more generally, as this is just for alcohols. Uh, the first thing that you always want to do when you start on an NMR spectrum is take your unknown molecular formula and check for degrees of unsaturation. So you may recall that you can count the number of carbons and predict how many hydrogens should be in that molecule if it's fully saturated. This is the 2n plus 2 rule. So for a molecule that has three carbons, it should have twice that number plus two hydrogens. So three times two is six, uh, plus two is eight. So this is a fully saturated molecule. That means that I shouldn't be looking for any rings or double bonds, and that can be helpful to limit the total number of structures I can get from this NMR spectrum. Now there's three pieces of information I will pick up from the NMR. Those are the x-axis down here, which is the delta, or the chemical shift, the integration, this box over here, which tells us the relative weight of each protons, we'll cover those in a second, and then the splitting pattern. So you see how each one of these signals looks a little bit different. This one has three peaks, this one has a bunch of peaks, this one has one, that one has three. That'll tell us about the neighboring number of protons here. So first up, the chemical shift. This lets us know about the electronic environment of the protons on the carbon. If you're on the far right-hand side of the spectrum, you are in a very electron-rich environment. That means that the carbons or the local environment is protecting the proton with a lot of electron density. Signals over here tend to not be near electronegative atoms. Signals on the far left-hand side are very electron poor. They are said to be de-shielded, or sometimes we call that downfield. We call this direction upfield. In the downfield region, we would expect protons to be attached to a carbon that is having electron density removed from it. Well, in my molecular formula up here, C3H8O, one of these atoms is most electronegative, and it's the oxygen. So I would expect this signal to be a little closer to the oxygen and this signal to be a little bit farther away. The other thing that my chemical shift is going to tell me is the number of types of protons present. So here I have one, two, three, four signals, which means of my eight hydrogens, they will be grouped into four general types. So there's going to be some symmetry here that means that there's groups of protons that all behave the same way. The next piece of information outside the chemical shift is the integration. Integration is a calculus term meaning area under the curve. So what this does is measures how much basically water each one of these signals can hold and then compares the weight of each one of those to each other. So the signal at point 9 here has a relative area of 3, which means that for every 3 of these protons, I have 2 protons at this signal. So it's a 3 to 2 ratio. And you can carry this all the way across. And what I recommend is if you, no matter how you see the integration, and, and they show up many different ways, is count up your total number of protons in the integration compare them to your unknown, and if they match, write them across the peaks here. Sometimes we will have to multiply. So I need to get to eight protons. Here I have three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So my integration matches my unknown formula. That's good news. I don't have to do any multiplication to get to my signals down here. So I'm going to go ahead and annotate this and say this signal at point 9 is worth three hydrogens. When you see three hydrogens written above a signal like this, that is defined. Whereas over here, it's the relative area. I can multiply these. When you see numbers written above the signal, that's how it is. You don't multiply at all. There's three protons here. There's two protons here. There is one proton here. And there are two protons here. Our final piece of information we're going to get from this is splitting. And splitting tells us about the neighborhood that protons are in. Splitting patterns follow what we call the n plus 1 rule. If you are on a carbon next to another carbon that has no protons, n plus 1, there's no neighbors there, would be one peak. If you have one neighbor, you'd be split into two peaks, or what we call a doublet. If you have two neighbors, you get split into what we call a triplet. This is an example of a triplet. If you have three neighbors, you get split into a quartet. And if you have more than three neighbors, we just call it a multiplet. This signal is a triplet. This signal has multiple peaks. We're not going to try and get the splitting here. So this is just going to be called a multiplet. This is a singlet, meaning that it has only uh, it has no neighbors. 
And this is another triplet. Now we're going to put these three pieces of information, our chemical shift, our integration, and our splitting patterns together to build up pieces of this molecule. And we are trying to figure out what is the structure of C3H8O. There are many constitutional isomers of C3H8O, but this spectrum refers to just one of them. I like to start on the far right-hand side. It tends to be the easiest place in the spectrum to do this. Um, I'm also taking note that when I start on the far right-hand side, I am in the most electron-rich area of the molecule. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm farthest away from that oxygen. Can I keep that back there? So at this signal, I know that I have three hydrogens that are all equivalent. And they have, because they're a triplet, they have two neighbors. Well, that gives me a p uh, this peak then, which I will write in red up here, it looks like a CH3 that is bound to a CH2. Now, I don't know what else is bound around this, but this signal would integrate to three, and so three protons here, and look like a triplet because it has two neighbors. So this signal in red is my red proton up here. Moving over, I now have a CH2. So we'll put this one in green. Now the CH2 here has lots of neighbors, and I don't want to try and diagnose where they are. I could have two over here and three over here, or two over here and two over there, but I'm not sure. I just know that there's a CH2 there based on the uh, overall integration. So I'm not going to try and do this any further. Notice I'm using little squiggle bonds here just to say that this piece, a CH2, exists somewhere in the molecule. So that's here. This singlet is really the, I think, probably the highlight of this video and what makes alcohols different than other NMR. Alcohol protons tend to be singlets because they don't copy, uh, they don't couple across the oxygen carbon bond. When I draw the final structure here, I'll explain this a little bit more, but you may recall that alcohols are acidic meaning that sometimes the proton's attached, but often the proton pops off of there. When the proton is not attached to the molecule, it can't couple. And so we don't experience uh, splitting patterns because it's like there's no neighbors there at all. So often you will see an alcohol in MR, a singlet somewhere. And this singlet can get quite broad because the OH bond can be attached very tight, or the OH bond can be very long as the proton starts to pop off of the molecule. And so this signal starts to broaden out. So I'm going, based on my previous knowledge of NMR, I'm thinking that's probably an OH proton. Um, I don't know that for sure, but it's a good bet that there's an OH around here. My final signal over here is a CH2 that has, three uh, that has two neighbors. It's a triplet. So a CH2. that has three neighbors. Now those three neighbors could be two hydrogens on one side and uh, a hydrogen on the other side. But if that's the case, I'm gonna start running into too many pieces here. So I've got this red piece, this green piece, the blue piece, and now this brown piece. If I split this into two hydrogens on one side and a hydrogen on the other side, I've gotta account for all of that. And while I have a singlet here, I don't necessarily have the pieces to make up for it. So to me, I'm gonna bet on this being a CH3 nearby. Now, I can always go back and check myself, but I recommend that you try and come up with pieces that somewhat make sense to you when you're first working these out, and then combine them together. If the pieces don't add up when you're finally done with all of this, then you go and reassess, did I make a, a bad assumption for one of these? So now I have a CH3 next to a CH2, a CH2 somewhere, an OH, and a CH2 next to a CH3. Well, my unknown molecular formula has three carbons, eight hydrogens, and an oxygen. So if I count just the carbons, three carbons. Over here I have one, two, three, four, five. That is too many carbons. So it's very likely that some of these carbons and some of those carbons are the same. And then what I'm seeing are commonality between the different peaks. So now what we're going to do is take our puzzle pieces and try and link them together to come up with the final structure for this. So a CH3 next to a CH2, a CH3 next to a CH2. These two signals, that CH2 and that CH2, could possibly be the same thing. So I'm going to link those together and see how that works out for my final structure. That would be CH3 to a CH2. I've now covered this signal, 
I'm sorry, this signal and this signal. And now I have a CH2 and an OH. Well, I've only got three carbons that I can link up here totally. And I know that as I'm going from this signal to this signal to this signal to that signal, I should be getting closer to the oxygen or the oxygen should be somewhere in this field. So it's highly likely that this next CH2 is attached to my ethyl group that I just showed you there and that the OH could be on the outside. Now this is just a guess at what the final structure could be. What I want to do when I come up with a structure like this is try and uh, predict what my, NMR would, my, what my NMR spectrum would look like based on this structure. Here I have three carbons, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens, and an oxygen, so C3H8O, that's good. There's no charges present here, which is also important because I didn't give any charges in my unknown molecular formula. And now what I want to do is figure out what would my NMR spectrum look like for this? Which signals would be most deshielded and which signals would be most shielded? There's an oddity about alcohol NMR where you might think that the proton that's directly attached to the oxygen would be the least shielded because oxygen's the most electronegative atom. But what ends up happening is that hydrogen gets so close to the oxygen that it's kind of almost protected. The oxygen is stealing electron density, but the proton gets close enough to where it's uh, in that sphere of influence. However, when the oxygen steals electron density from this carbon, these hydrogens become especially deshielded. And that's why you see these signals particularly downfield. So we'll cover that as we go through it. When I look at this molecule, um, outside of that little song and dance about which proton's most shielded near an alcohol, these protons undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly should be the most shielded. I should have a CH3 somewhere on the right-hand side of my spectrum that integrates to three, because there's three protons on this carbon, and splits into a triplet, because this CH3 has two neighbors. That's this signal here, a triplet that integrates to three on the far right-hand side of the spectrum. The next signal over, I would expect to be this carbon. I've gotten one carbon closer or moved kind of one house closer down the street towards this electronegative oxygen. And in that process, I have deshielded this carbon. I would expect to see a signal that integrates to two and is a multiplet. The reason is this CH2 has three neighbors over here and two neighbors over here. So that's a total of five neighbors. N plus one, we would ex expect six peaks. In a perfect world, you would see all six peaks down here, but most NMR instruments are not sensitive enough to give you that information. So we just call it a multiplet and say, look, that CH2 has got a bunch of neighbors, and that's the signal we see here. The next two signals uh, seem like they should be switched, but again, going back to this, the proton that's directly attached to the oxygen tends to actually be a little shielded from being near the oxygen, and that's why our singlet for the uh, proton, for the hydroxyl proton, shows up here around two, and the CH2 signal shows up a little bit farther down to four. So this is my hydroxyl proton. On this side, which is this CH2, I don't couple to that proton because of the dissociations. We talked about um, how OH protons can dissociate. They can be very closely bound or they can spread out. That leads to the signal spreading out, but it also means that this proton can completely go away and make an O minus. Well, if the proton's not there, then there's nothing to couple to on this side. So these protons don't see any protons on that side. That leads these signals to only couple to the neighboring carbons. They don't couple across the oxygen. So this signal would integrate to two and would look like a triplet because I don't consider the OH, I just consider the CH2. And so that's why I see a triplet here with two hydrogens on the outside. So my correct structure for my C3H8 unknown molecule is one propanol.